Hello and welcome to a very, very special program in which three of what I think are the finest minds look ahead at where India is heading and where we're at right now. During this program, we will be making hard forecasts on growth, prices, the stock market. Will there be another crash coming, which the governor of the RBI recently alluded to and pointed out that it's a major concern? So what's the forecast for India? Boom or crash? Now, if you want to know where to invest your savings, keep it safe, go for a big upside, keep tuned into these three wonderful gentlemen. And they're not just talking in theory. I was going to say they're not just pretty faces. Each one has created exceptional enterprises. In fact, the market cap of what they created will be over $125 billion. That's the three of them combined. About the, the budget, the government of India would love to have some of that. Just have a, um, you, you don't really need to introduce them. The Parikh created the most fantastic brand and the most fantastic organization, HDFC, $60 billion. Amazing. Sunil Mittal who I've always said what you have done has added 2% to India's growth rate. Because if we were still using phones, we would be 2% in our growth rate, not GDP. That's more important. How you've transformed communication, decision-making is just uh, something we should all be thankful for. And Anil Agarwal, $35 billion organization. And now putting a lot of it back into doing things for society. In fact, uh, this here is in many ways, frankly, the new India story of real business. And if you add to them the exploding virtual world of Snapdeal, Flipkart, Quicker, uh, OLX, you have the two most exciting growth stories for the future of India. Real, bricks and mortar, telecom, banking, and virtual, uh, which is the up and coming new area. In addition to forecasting the Indian economy during the next uh, uh, one hour, we will ask each one of these successful business leaders this one question. If the Prime Minister was to call you and ask each of you to recommend three things that need to be done for India, what would those three recommendations, policy recommendations be? We'll ask the three recommendations to the PM during the course of the show but let's start with the first one, Deepak Parikh. The first recommendation, the prime, you're sitting in front of the Prime Minister and he said, give me your, what's one recommendation out of the three? I would say that allocation of resources, both natural resources and other resources, which are always in short supply, should be given in an absolutely transparent manner. We have got into this mess because of favoritism, because of vested interests, because we have not followed the rule. Right. Uh, we have right. given entry, backdoor entry to people, whether it's... And resources, I mean spectrum, I mean land, I mean uh, coal, gas, iron ore, any, any mineral any resources. Where the so underground... country owns and has to arm it out, should you be have done, to auction it, trans you auction have it. to auction it, you have to auction it transparently, you have to auction it on the net. And people can bid and everyone knows that there is no unfair treatment for anyone. I think that's hugely, hugely because... All our pending cases on this coal India, the controversy that the Supreme Court has now brought up about cancelling allocations, God knows how Maybe many. quite rightly actually. But how do it was non-transparent. How, how do you cancel? It? It's very difficult. But it happened in telecom, right? It was done by e, e uh, auction, and it was hugely successful. There was never in that area there was never any doubt about the process, and and it was of course everybody had to pay a high price. But in the end, you pay the price and you move on. You don't. No one questions you. Do you agree that it's in a major area? Yeah, I would say you know distribution of uh, natural resources for. Commercial exploitation. I, mean, I think that's what we're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. There will be very large uh, areas of uh, distribution of resources for school, land for schools, uh, facilities for hospitals, other public good. That will need to be <coughs> perhaps dealt with in right, a very different, different way. Yes. And I think that's where the challenge lies. But to your point, what should the Prime Minister do? Yes, your uh, first recommendation would be what? 
Yeah, first of all, I think, in my opinion, the biggest thing a leadership can deliver to a nation is hope. For right. me, there is nothing more powerful than creating a hope in a nation. I have to say on that account, uh, the Prime Minister has done a wonderful job. And my, therefore, urging to him would but be keep the hope intact, because that's very important. That's a starting point. Now, how do you, uh, he'll say, okay, how do I do, how do I generate hope? First of all, he's done it in a remarkable way. Not him, just it, say any Prime Minister asks you, how would I generate hope? You create a conducive environment, and right. in hope you start making decisions which are favorable towards investment. Right. Uh, foreigners start coming back in. You see the stock market's an all-time high. First right. quarter has seen $20 billion flowing in foreign investments, both FII and FDI. That is what you call the starting point of any rebuilding or revival of a national it economy. must be a positive spirit positive in the country. Anil Agarwal, I think you were also mentioning earlier about allocation by e-auctions. E-auctions is a transparent manner. You, in your area, though, you have specialized globally in natural resources. What would, you, what would your first recommendation to the Prime Minister, or any, any Prime Minister be, a leader of this country? See, above the earth, below the ground, the most important how I look at. Right. Above the earth is agriculture. Below the ground, oil and gas, gold, copper, coal, any resources. In all over the world, how the, the, the development has taken place, whether you take North America, whether you take Australia, Central America, Middle East, they all have grown. One is above the ground, which is agriculture, doesn't go enough in the coffer of the government. Below the ground, how the 50% of the revenue, by and large, go to the government. Worldwide. And worldwide. Right. Worldwide. That's, so that's see, a huge what, source of revenue. See what Mr. Obama, mm -hmm. for 10 years back, they're invading anywhere in the world for the, for the oil and gas. Today, because of his simple policy of shale, the company, the country is going to be self-sufficient. So they don't need one trigger. trigger. Just one trigger to one get trigger. shale, oil and gas transforms their need. Today we have 90% of our import of oil and gas, 100% import of our gold, 100% import of our copper, any resource. Our mindset is that we have to import. We have a rich mineral resource country. We are Sony ki chidiya. Really? That's how it's been called. We have it. We have it. But we are not using it. Yeah. The, the, the important thing is that we have to, like if you see the uh, China, they get, they get 100 billion, 120 billion dollars every year. The money is coming in. The, or you name the one company. So which just is tell not me, there. let's say oil and gas. How would you increase, make us less dependent on importing oil and gas? How would you do that in yeah. practice? And any country does not produce 50% of their uh, energy requirement. We cannot eradicate their poverty. We have to have 20 large companies working in oil and gas. 20. So you're not Minimum just saying one 20. or two large companies. No. You want to open it up to 20, 30 number of companies exploiting oil and gas. Minimum 20 company has to come. You have to create a conducive environment. You have to give them facilities. You know, we need expertise. Indian entrepreneur, Indian company does not have expertise. We have to give them a conducive. They have enough place to go. So let me just ask you, say, gold. Do you think if we allowed lots of, just again, e-auction gold mines, we could get much more gold out of our ground? Absolutely. The Kolar field, the exploration uh, which, which is required, uh, you know, we used, we used to produce phenomenal gold. You know, every co coal mine has been, the gold mine has been shut down. Even the Supreme Court has given a ruling saying that auction our gold mine. And let, um, let's get our own goal rather than import it. Absolutely. Our Do you agree with that, uh, Deepak Parekh, that we are just not, we are getting, we are an import mentality. We feel we have to import 90% of our oil when we just don't exploit what we've got. Absolutely. 
I think why is it that not a single ENP company, a large ENP overseas, the big boys in the oil industry, why have they not come to India up to now? Because of uncertainty of our policy, because of change of regulations, frequent change of regulation in between, there is no there is no energy policy of 10 years. This is a long term game. This is a capital intensive, high technology. We do not have capital. We do not have technology. We need these people. Learn from China on this. Yes. Learn from China. So I, I, the message I'm getting is, they'll come first if they have hope that India is <clears throat> serious. Secondly, they'll come to help us exploit our natural resources, and we've got lots of it unexploited all these years. And thirdly, it has to be done in a transparent Very. manner through e-auctions. That combination could transform Indian. You know, 40% of our import bill in the last two years has been one item, which is crude, crude oil. oil. 40%, which is growing rapidly. And we should be thankful that despite this, the, socio -pol the political issues that are going on in the Middle East, oil prices are all time low. Right. For the last 15 months, we have the lowest oil price today. Right. It's a great boon to India. Otherwise, this but we should not be so dependent on global oil prices. We should have our own. Absolutely. The, this, this, is, uh, this is the most, most... We have an import bill of almost $500 billion. This is absolutely not acceptable. Okay. So I think that is a very good first. If I was uh, any prime minister, I would be very... I think that's a serious way to act. Build up hope, positive attitude, look at your own resources and e-auction them and let there be 20, 30 companies, not just two companies, three companies. You're one of the two, three, so you don't mind more competition. Unless the, you create the market, how you can survive? Let's just move on and just go a little bit above the ground, as you say. We were talking about below the ground. And see, what's happening in the last four or five years has been <coughs> a bit of a problem. If we look at India's investment growth, that has begun to stall. What has happened is the sharp growth that we had between 2000 and 2007 has now dropped off. And that is something to really worry about. From nearly, it went up from about 20%, 25% to nearly over 35%, and now it's drifting down back to around uh, 27, 20, 30, 32%. And there's been a major problem, the slowdown of new investment projects. If we just have a look at the data on what's happened to new investment projects. If you look at the per period between 2003 and 2009, 2006 and 2009, 40% of our GDP was new investment announcements. What's happened in the last three years? It's down to 15%. Now, that is a terrible decline. It's a major decline in new investment projects. And it's not only in industry. Just look at what's happening in agriculture, where eventually our future is going to lie. 2000 and 2002 to 2006 was the general trend. In those four years, we added 9 million hectares of new irrigation. Irrigation is the future, of a source of growth in agriculture. Look what's happened in the last four years, of 2007 till 2011, for which we have data. 1 million. From 9 million in four years, only 1 million new irrigation projects, 1 million hectares. It's a shocking slowdown. And uh, to look at in another way, India still has a great growth story in manufacturing. Just look at where our manufacturing is compared to the rest of the world. In China, 33% of its GDP is manufacturing. Thailand, 30%. Malaysia, 24%. Philippines, 21%. And India, 13% of our GDP is manufacturing. Uh, so, Sunil Mittal, there are two ways to look at that. One is 13% is terrible, but also that means we have potential. We could go to 30%, 25% at least. There's potential for growth in manufacturing. You know, we, we should actually look at where we were just a few years back. Right. We were at 17% of GDP, and the target was to quickly claw back to 20% and above. 
and uh, the much talked about national manufacturing policy was put into place. Uh, I thought the number was more like 14 and a half. Um, I'm not sure if 13 is correct, but assume yeah, whether this it's is 14. 2011 and maybe 14, yeah, so but 14, still way yeah. below. So instead of going uh, towards the direction of 20% uh, part of the GDP, we've actually come down. 14. And the reason for that is, I, actually no surprise, if you would have talked to many of my peers in the last two or three years, nobody was talking about investment in capacity. Everybody was talking about conservation of capital. And that would have led to this uh, situation. I'm, no, I'm not yeah. surprised at all. Yeah. In fact, when I used to debate with some of my friends or people in the government, they said things are moving. I said they are moving because we had put our foot on the pedal in 2005, 6, and yeah. 7. Yeah. And the momentum that we are seeing is because of that. But the foot has come off. And you're going to feel the effects three years that's later. That's what is happening now. Exactly. So to my mind, manufacturing is one of the most important areas to concentrate. It will create jobs. Of course, it will create a lot of uh, ancillary momentum around it. And for export purposes, in any case, we need to manufacture more. Hugely, yeah. The good news is the previous government in the last couple of years of their term were talking a lot about it, but you didn't see much coming through. Right. This government is very heavily committed towards manufacturing no, revival. Yes. In fact, the Prime Minister's uh, clarion call in Japan was largely towards manufacturing. Come and make in India, as he says. Yeah. And my own view is that you will see some turnaround because investments will come, both to Indian and overseas investment. And we should see a, a lot of more manufacturing. One area where I must point out, uh, while Anil has mentioned about oil imports at $500 billion, electronic imports are not too far behind. True. In True. fact, the projection is in 2020, electronic manufacturing of all kinds, including telecommunications, would be the largest import bill Overtake oil in this country. Now, that we should be manufacturing. Yeah. This is an area. So, Deepak, how do we get manufacturing going from 13%, let's go at least 25% of our GDP should be manufacturing? See, take two or three sectors, Pranay. Take, uh, you know, Sunil is talking about hardware, chip manufacture, semiconductor. For, this year, we imported $100 billion of import, uh, electronics, mainly chips, microchips. That's crazy. This is going to be $400 billion in 2020. If we are world leaders in software, why are we not in hardware? Right. Why is Intel, ADM, um, uh, Samsung, why have they not come here with hardware? Why can't Indian companies set up hardware? It is an expensive project. It requires government help, government support, concessional land, concessional power, easy access for foreign technology. And this is very heavily capital intensive. But and these, we, that is manufacturing. When you say concession, these should be clearly spelt out. Spelt and out. just, you know, these are the rules, stick by them. You know, five years no, ago, hazy, you five know. years ago, Intel came here. We're very serious of putting up a chip manufacturing, a ten billion dollar project, Huge which project. would give massive amount of jobs in Chennai. Government could not give them any any concessions. Taiwan invited them, Malaysia invited them, China invented them. Vietnam, Vietnam, and they went to Vietnam. So, Anil Agarwal, I mean. We've seen this in other countries. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We see the concessions others give. We have to match them and be transparent about them. So in this area, say manufacturing as well, would you say have hundreds of companies come in, even into every sector, let things open up? Is that what you're suggesting globally, not only Indian, globally? You have to simplify the process. You know, the Prime Minister has said that one million people has to be entrepreneur. They have to set up their own industry. They have to create what we need. We need to eradicate our poverty. We need to create job. And what you say, manufacturing is going to support that. And manufacturing need a simple policy, a transparent policy, which people, state and state government and central government coordination. And it's worked in other countries. We just have to copy. Or if you don't like the word copy, first copy, then improve, or be inspired by other countries. Just this, everybody's got rules. We can have those rules. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you look at, we are, we are the most democratic country. It should, it should be better here than anywhere else because the rules prevail here. You know, if I can just add man, uh, manufacturing, let's take defense. We are one of the largest importers of defense. Total import of defense. Global, we are the largest. 15% of global manufacturing or defense India comes to India. Comes to 15%. The second is five. So, so we're doing a big service to the rest of the global now, economy. Now, the total Oil, FDI we've received in the last 12 years in defense 
is four million dollars, four point four million dollars. This is government numbers, not my number. Four million dollars and million, million. Now here, the defense policy that government has come out recently, they have denotified number of uh, products in it, but what China did, they allowed 100% in defense. But they said in five years, you must come down to 40. But they allowed 100%. To start with. Yes. Because that attracted the capital. They got technology. They got their uh, know-how. And then they were all, the work was done by Chinese engineers. They're not going to transfer millions of people from there. Now we have got 49. There is no difference from 26 to 49. There's not one ounce of better. Voting rights, nothing. Voting, nothing. 26 and 49 is exactly the same. I do not expect we get money in, in, in defense. Now, this is if the China's Indian manufacturing lobby. This is the Indian manufacturing lobby. That is also because, one of the Because we heard in the early days that the government was looking at 74% for defense. Yeah. But the Indian manufacturing lobby prevented that to happen. Right. I must say, I had one, one year stint in the government of India in the early days. And industrialists used to come and I say, you should open up your sector. They said, no, no, we're all for opening up. But my sector is a little special. <laughs> this sector has got special aspects. I'm sure defense people say, oh, defense is a little special. Don't open this. Otherwise, open up everything. But you're right. It's the Indian sure. industrialist who's as much to blame in not opening up as the government. you were not a part of it. <laughs> I support it 100%. 100%. In fact, right from the CI time of the president, come down I personally years. believe that if a Raytheon or Rolls Royce comes and sets our factories here, we are not a small country to be worried about what they'll do here. We will rather have the manufacture here under our wings. I mean, I'm of 100%. Employ our people. One more area which is uh, an issue, but uh, is the growth in GDP. And they say if you ask five economists what the GDP's growth is going to be, you'll get 10 different uh, opinions, but not with these. We asked five of the brightest economists, what their forecast is for GDP. And this is what they said. My forecast for GDP growth for FY15 is 5.5%. And, and for FY16, it's 6.5% plus. So I'm quite optimistic that we may end up uh, the year, uh, this particular fiscal, uh, anywhere between 57 to 6%. Uh, that's my take. Uh, you know, very optimistic would be six, but I won't go below 5.7. Uh, things are going to improve. FY16 is likely to be even better than this year because this year we didn't have a good rainfall. So hopefully if we have a normal rainfall next year, uh, agriculture will improve, rural incomes will improve, and that will boost the demand in the system. And given the business climate that is improving, uh, hopefully in the months to come, FY16, I would pitch for anywhere between 6.5 to 7 percent. So we see growth accelerating uh, this year, this fiscal year, to about 5.5 percent, which actually will be quite uh, creditable because you've got kind of concerns about a drought, so agriculture growth will be quite weak. Uh, the government's on a fiscal consolidation path as well. So uh, accounting for those factors, if we do get to 5.5 percent, what that will suggest is the underlying growth momentum of industry and services will be closer to 6 percent. Next year, I think, uh, FY16, uh, we expect growth to accelerate further to about 6.5% or so, uh, because I think then the policy actions uh, of the government really begin to uh, come into play and will boost, uh, will boost growth. Current fiscal year, and we are already in the middle of that, the expectation for GDP growth is uh, about 59 to 6.2%, so thereabouts. And for next year, FY16, the uh, GDP growth will be higher. Uh, perhaps 6.5% to 7%. Our projections are like 5.7% in this particular financial year, uh, which should eventually be moving up to 6, 6.4 in the next financial year. And we think there can uh, be uh, potential for further upside surprises to this particular number. So Anil Agarwal, we are talking about 6% this year, maybe 7% next year. These are not really high figures. Uh, we know that all the BRIC countries have slowed down, but you see the slowdown in China from a 12% average to a 9% GDP average. We've slipped from 9% to 6%. We need to get up to 9%. These are better than the last two years, but still not satisfying, is it? 7%. 
Absolutely. We have a tremendous potential to grow 1.2 billion people. No, one, for, uh, one fifth population of the world live here. Democratic country, it has all the potential. We have to gear up. Even, even if you, as you talk about the agriculture, and if you look at the agriculture has gone down. If GDP growth has gone down. Look at the irrigation. We have one million compared to nine million. This is one, almost a tenth. I just wanted to go to something which all of you mentioned, and that is get foreign funds coming in through hope, through e-auctions, through uh, giving them clear rules. Just look at the difference between foreign direct investment in China and foreign direct investment in India. And we're talking about uh, uh, last three years. China gets an average of $255 billion of foreign direct investment into China. India, $30 billion. That's one-tenth, Deepak Parik, one-tenth. Now, rule of thumb, <coughs> people say, it's 50 to 60 billion dollars of foreign direct investment gives you 1% extra on your growth rate. So you're talking about 255 billion, you're talking about 4 to 5% added to your growth rate because it goes into your economy. Here we got 30, so foreign direct is not improving our growth rate at all. How do we get to 250 billion? We have to simplify our processes. <coughs> China is much more simple? Much more. It's almost automatic. And it's quick. You see, we have to reduce the red tape. We should have clear policies. We must go out and encourage foreign investment. Uh, because of the lack of clarity, in India, nothing is black and white. Everything is gray. And so those who have brought money like Vodafone or Eti Salad, they are big companies. Right. They are global companies. And they are stuck with billions of dollars invested. Telenor. And the message that sends. The message that sends is terrible. And uh, so, so we have it, to rectify it, our policies and make it open, transparent, simple. One window clearance. We could do that. <coughs> Sunil Mittal, we could actually simplify and get, okay, not, not 250, but even 100 billion, 150 billion, it transform our growth rate. No, no absolutely. I think uh, a lot has been said both by Anil and uh, Deepak here. Potential exists. There's a large population, consuming population. Everybody gets it. There's nobody in the world, no board that meets around the globe doesn't see India as a great market. The issue is on ease of doing business. That's on, it. And yes. you meet all of them all the time. That's and on it. that, our ranking is actually rather shocking. I mean, so if you can fix ease of doing business, which lies in the governance of doing business, in government policy making, its execution, I think that's what needs to be done. To my mind, I mean, we were in Japan, they've got about four and a half, five trillion dollars sitting on the side, earns nothing, ne negative interest rates. For them to move and they want to have a second alternate base outside China in an urgent way, yes. 50, 60, 80 billion dollars moving into India, 100 billion is absolutely no problem. Four and a half trillion is, is so doable. Combined with hope, we need decision making and execution of those decisions across the country, whether a central approval is required or a state approval is required. We need to make India an easy place to do business. And that's not a demand of the global so, world. It's also of the domestic sector. You know. For ordinary people, it's so frustrating that we have this potential. It's like my golf. Great potential, never make my full potential. No. That's this country. We can't, we've got the potential and we're just simple decision making. See, you have to decide where the money comes. 100 billion has come. But if you look at entire India, we don't have more than three or four projects. The infrastructure, the amount of money can go in in infrastructure. Just Anything and make everything. it clear and easy to come into India. And clear policy, how it should be done. I mean, if China, which is meant to be a socialist country, can do 255 billion, we can do at 150 without sacrificing certain of our principles. One concern is extension of bank credit to industry. Right. This year, August to August, August 13 to 14, we've had the lowest expansion of bank credit. 10.9%. Last year was 16. The one before it was 13. This August to August, only 10.9%. What does that indicate? Pe banks are not lending money. People don't have projects. Pipeline of projects is not there, that's whether right. it's domestic or foreign. Bank credit must... That's deposits have grown indicator. much faster. Deposits have grown much faster than the bank credit. That is a leading, leading indicator, indicator of problems of, to come. Of, uh, yeah, so yeah. so you the know, first thing that you see if there's trouble is... Bank credit, and credit expansion. Up.